And I think that's what my passion is about, is explaining what some why some people who have dementia react in certain ways. So if we can understand that, you know, say they're not seeing very well, they're not hearing very well, so all their senses might be um, very distorted, we, you know, and and maybe then by understanding what that person's going through, we can understand a lot of the time people have dementia are living in f- absolute fear because they may not be understanding what we're saying to them. They may not be able to, to express themselves. And of course, when you're the caregiver, you don't know that's what's going on, do you? Because you're, you're living your world and trying to, like you say, put out the fires. So, yeah, and that the, the practical and emotional um support that we can all give through our through outsourcers and through my work and ev- and everyone else who's on your podcast um is it's lovely to be part of this it really is lovely to 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 be with a lot of other passionate people who feel the same Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. We're the global community of authors writing about Alzheimer's and dementia from personal experience to light the way for others. I'm Marianne Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. And I'm Christy Byrne Yates, a licensed educational psychologist, dementia daughter, Al's author, and coach focused on the sandwich generation. Please join us for bi-weekly episodes with our authors as we talk about their dementia journeys, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. This is the Whole Care Network. Helping you tell your story one podcast at a time. Content presented in the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed in this podcast are solely those of the host and guest and may not represent the views and opinions of the Whole Care Network. Always consult with your physician for any medical advice, and always consult with your attorney for any legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Hi, I'm Susan of All's Authors. When I was a caregiver for my mother with dementia, resources to educate and offer support were hard to come by. Alz Authors believes in the power of storytelling to support and encourage those impacted by Alzheimer's and dementia. Custom Caregiver Collections is a customized collection of memoirs, novels, caregiver guides, children's books, and more. This collection of well-vetted books comes displayed in a beautifully crafted wooden tabletop bookshelf with Alz Authors branding. Custom Caregiver Collections supports our goal of bringing real books to real people in real places and are perfectly suited for senior care communities, senior centers, doctor's offices, memory cafes, and professional or personal libraries. If you or your organization is interested in ordering or building a custom caregiver collection, we can guide you through choices of books written in many categories to support your needs. Want to build your own book collection? Contact us at allsauthors.com slash ccc to get started. Hi, Jane. Welcome to the All's Authors podcast. How are you today? Oh, thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. It's very sunny over in the UK at the moment. And thanks for having me, Marianne. Well, thank you for coming. We've been trying to put this together for a while. And uh, today's the day to hear all about you and, and your work, your beautiful book, Finding the Light in Dementia, and also the new course that you're starting to uh, publicize. And we want to hear all the details on that. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. What brought you to dementia work? Uh, well, I 
started working in a care home when I was training to be a nurse. So I started working as a care assistant and I don't know, I always felt a sort of connection and a real sense of whether it's empathy, I'm not sure what I would call it now when I was 18, but certainly felt very sorry for people who couldn't communicate, who struggled to communicate. So I, uh, as I was working as a trainee nurse as well, I was caring for people who had dementia quite a bit and people who'd had stroke. So I always felt drawn to people who couldn't communicate their needs very well. And in my own quiet way, as a student nurse, I used to spend a lot of time with those residents or patients or, you know, individuals. uh, And I used to desperately try and find ways to connect with them. So there's something in there from a a deep sense of need of communicating and supporting people, I think. I went on to qualify as a nurse and I worked in various roles, you know, in, in the hospitals and things. But then I also went on to manage a care home for a while, so which was rather nice because I had a lot more say in how we were able to care. I always say care with people, not care for, because I'm very much about that whole partnership as opposed, uh, as opposed to a power relationship, really. And then um, a few years later, I then, uh, well, I, I did my nursing degree, but I also then went and worked in a memory clinic in Bath in the UK. And here we, uh, I helped support people through their diagnosis of dementia uh, and, and their families. And obviously that's a very traumatic side of, of the work very much. So, so basically I've cared for people from, from beginning throughout their, their journey, whether in communities and at home up to end of life, really. And again, that, that, desperate need to help support people to communicate has always stayed with me. So I had the chance to do a PhD about 10 years ago, and I was very fortunate in that I could um, maneuver the question of what we were studying into something that I was passionate about. And this came up again, this need to communicate with people. So I actually developed a multi-sensory way of helping support partners to people who have dementia through through reminiscence and life story work around holidays so they were generally happy events uh, and it was it was really successful in that through the use of objects smells sharing food and drink making films together it was a lovely creative process actually helped bring back some of those couples together as a couple, as opposed to that being, you know, um, they they were spouses for the study. So um, some of them had been quite worn out with with the caregiving and struggling. And actually through this um, activities, uh, it brought them back together. And it actually helped stimulate conversation and memory for the person who has dementia and, and their partner, really. As I say, it was all around holidays, so it was a lovely, a lovely piece of research, and I and I really am trying to get more research funding to do more work on this. But it's informed um, my knowledge. I I'm learning all the time about dementia, even though I've worked in the field for thirty years. Um, and and this is the passion I want to get across: is how we can help people learn to communicate and to connect with that person when they're unable to either communicate themselves or actually understand what someone's saying to them. That wasn't a very short answer. Sorry, Maria. <laughs> no, but it's just so <laughs> fascinating and uh, so important because I think cu- communication is at the crux of the difficulties in mm, caregiving, absolutely. you know, um, people, you know, getting across their, e- either party getting across their message, what their needs are, mm. what their wants are at, at the time, their, their thoughts. And, um, I think a lot of people would really appreciate maybe learning a few of the methods that you tried. Could you explain one or two? What what did you do? What were these methods that you used to get this communication going? Um, well, firstly, it was about getting to know the couple in this in this instance um, and building up trust because I was new coming into you know, and 
really it was more about going with the flow a little bit, not making anything too structured. But I'd say, you know, I want to talk to you about your holidays. I, I, I took a few props in, not knowing whether those props would relate to them. Because of course, holidays are different for everyone. Uh, but I, I took in some sun cream. So if you love the beach, that smell of sun cream, that really does, um, st- can stimulate some memories. Uh, I had some sand, some, some shells, all of those sort of, you know, things to stimulate somebody's, um, uh, thoughts. And then really it was more about chatting with them, finding out what their holidays were. And often it was the spouse that was talking more because the person had dementia was, was struggling a bit. But, um, so the initial meeting was to explain what the research was about. Well, when I came back to each of the family, each to the couples, the next visit, I'd sort of suggested maybe you want to bring get some props yourself that are meaningful to you. The research ended up being called a suitcase of memories because every time I went to someone's house, they brought out a suitcase, filled it full of all their maps, holiday memorabilia, um, anything that reminded them of happy events, happy places. So with this one particular couple, uh, we sat down, they showed me photographs. So I then, uh, one interesting fact here that happened that the lady, because a lot of people, as you know, may not be able to see very well. So, or they see in a different way. And uh, we'd, I put together a lot of their photographs into a film, uploaded uploaded all of that into a film. And then I added soundscapes to the, to the film. And the lady at first, they, their choice of holidays was in Australia from when they used to visit their daughter. And she couldn't quite make out the picture of this bird at all. Um, she really couldn't see, work it out properly. And then as soon as the sound of the bird came in, it was actually a kookaburra. And suddenly her language, and when she heard the sound, she was, the memories were just coming back straight away about that. Oh, that bird, that blimmin' bird. It was, it was every morning I could cheer it. It would go off, you know, and she couldn't remember the, the name. That doesn't matter. But that memory of that emotion, and this is the big thing I'm interested in, is that emotion that's, that sparked was really positive. So they, that then sparked more memories for both of them. Um, and then they talked a lot of eating and drinking is a huge thing uh, when we're looking at memories of holidays. So I was picking up all this information and, and this, um, on one of the weeks I went, I took, I took a whole buffet of food of all the things they talked about that they used to eat. And also they talked about this specific hot chocolate they used to drink when they went to a specific restaurant or cafe. So I found the recipe and we made the hot chocolate together. She hadn't been in the kitchen for years. And you see, we still don't know. A lot of people will say, why bother? Because a lot of people lose their sense of smell or this, that and the other. And I'm thinking, yes, but actually my my thing is maybe we can stimulate that when we're looking at the senses together, as long as we're not overloading someone. So they made the hot chocolate together with all the different spices in. And she was starting to smell. She was tasting. She could... um she was starting to remember, you know, so it was, it was about stimulating a, a joyful event. Um, so, so again, looking at the multi-sensory side of things, whilst also being aware that you don't want to overwhelm someone either. Mm-hmm. But I, I, I'm really, because really, life is multi-sensory, isn't it? You oh, know, yeah, we don't, sure. we don't live a life in one, on one sense. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, so it was really inspiring to see and they was they started laughing and joking again together and and they did argue a little bit as well which was quite interesting because it was showed what their relationship was like before she was adamant about a certain memory and he was you know and i think she was right and hmm. um so I, there was a little bit of the old selves back okay. you know their sense of their old selves that was that was really inspiring 
That is inspiring. Mm. And when you mentioned holiday, when you first said that, I thought, you know, in, in the U.S., a holiday is like, you know, Easter and Christmas and Halloween and all of those days. Yeah. So that would give you a whole other set of props and, and yeah. um, you know, things that you could use to stimulate senses that I think would really be meaningful to someone. And everybody has that kind of stuff in their house. It's really easy to get. So mm -hmm. you probably have photographs too. And there's music accompanies a lot of it. So that would be really interesting. But when you discuss holiday from the UK perspective, it's what we here in the States would call like a vacation. A vacation. Yeah. 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 So, exactly. yeah. yeah. so I just wanted to clarify that because um, that's a whole different thing. I mean, they're, they're, but they're all wonderful opportunities to engage with someone and you don't have to do it. Mm. You can talk about Christmas anytime. It doesn't have to be in December. You know, you could Absolutely. just bring that subject mm. up and see if you could stimulate that person to um, join you mm. in communicate. And, and, and one of the things I, I want to do um, if I can get some funding later on is to, to look at this more because I, I you know, where, People who have dementia may struggle to eat or be motivated to meet, to eat possibly or drink, you know, perhaps bringing in this sort of multi-sensory idea. So, so I don't know what it's like in the States, but in, in the UK, fish and chips by the seaside mm -hmm. is quite a, mm -hmm. a, a sort of holiday memory for many people. So, you know, maybe, you know, we could be looking at the suitcase of memories where, you have a few props around you that might remind you of of being on holiday. The sound of seagulls, or uh, again, it's got to be very culturally sensitive as well. Um, but then, you know, bringing in this is where other families might be able to bring in, perhaps pop and get some fish and chips. It might just be something that might just help make make the um, experience for everybody a bit more mm -hmm. enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Whilst though, Marianne, I'm very aware as you've been there, that can also be quite exhausting for families to think about doing those things as well. So mm -hmm. I, I'm really hoping I can get some uh, sort of care staff or uh, some sort of befrienders to, that could come and facilitate this so it wouldn't be such a big thing for mm -hmm. all families, you know. Yeah, that's yeah, something I that could this... be used, you know, in a memory cafe or even at, yeah. like, I just can't give a support group where you might bring your, your loved one with you and, and they would have their own activities off off to the side or in another room. Their, their social time as well, people who coordinate mm. those activities, they could use some of these suggestions in the well, chat too. What what was interesting was um, I I let them lead the research because I I wanted it to be very much co-produced and come from them, and actually um, the lady who had Alzheimer's said they they went to a forget me not group, and she said I'd love to show our friends what we've done, mm -hmm. so we had an event where we actually disseminated the the sort of research results as such to the people that mattered, so we. I, I got all sorts of props, seaside props, different things. And um, we had ice creams and we showed their film. And everyone there was saying, I want one of these. I want one of these suitcase of memories, you know, and it was like, and it's, it's not rocket science, but it's just mm -hmm. having the ability and the energy. I'm very aware of that to yeah. to do that but actually it was it was a really joyful experience it took mm -hmm. people away from that overwhelming the dementia when i first visited these couples the dementia was massive and actually later on that was getting a bit smaller and life was coming back a bit so yeah so i'd really love to do some more work on that but it has informed the training and the courses of created so mm -hmm. in, in that way quite helped. Well, building that suitcase would could be a job for like a grandchild or or another like mm. child in the family that wants to help but doesn't know what to do, and maybe they yeah. have the skill um, to create that video or to you know go through all the old memorabilia and photographs and, and souvenirs and things and put something meaningful together. Mm. So that gives them. And I think points. I think that's really important. What you've touched on there as well is often people don't know what to do. 
they feel mm-hmm. helpless, mm-hmm. you know. So I was thinking perhaps friends could come in, but yeah, definitely getting in, getting grandkids in or other members making it, you know, a, a really family event. I mean, we used to do scrapbooks. We used to stick things into scrapbooks when we were growing up. Well, this is just a little bit something extended from that, really. But again, it's it's getting people to realise there's so much we can do. And I think that's a lot of what I want to get across is when some people say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do now. And I understand they must feel that. They must absolutely feel mm-hmm. that exhausted, whatever. But actually, there is so much we can do. Yeah. And that's my mission throughout the training, throughout everything, is to get that point across. Mm-hmm. That with the right help, or is just to, just one little thought that, in fact, one of the members of staff who's just started my training She's just said, um, oh, it's made me think outside the box. It's made me actually think. She said, I was caring for someone who was really distressed. And she said, I thought about your trait and all, because I come up with all these ideas and and it's not just me. I'll explain that later. But she said, oh, I found a film of this lady's hometown. So we sat together and she was much happier. And, and I it just, oh, I just felt so amazing because I thought, yeah, the training, what the training did was to, to show you that you can think of other ways too, mm-hmm. you know? And it was, mm-hmm. and, and she was so excited about that because it worked as well. I know it mm-hmm. won't always work, but so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that whole thinking outside the box. Yeah. Definitely. Now, is any of that written in your book, Finding the Light in Dementia Care? Um, yes. Yeah, there are. I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, this, it goes throughout the seat. Yes, there's a lot in there about, I mean, I talk initially about um, what happens following a diagnosis and what, you know, what we might recommend, different things like that. And then we go through communication, memory, environment, and the environment um, theme of creating a calm, safe place sort of talks about the importance of those surroundings and maybe using sensory props to help communicate. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of really good stuff in this book. So it's highly recommended by all the authors. So um, I'm just looking oh, at some of the you. chapters here. It's 12 chapters. One is using memories to keep in touch, which is what we mm-hmm. just talked about and staying connected to life stories. And also authors, we're all about sharing our stories you know, caregiver to caregiver and, and, you know, person to person. So we can stay connected that way and understand, better understand the disease process, understand our loved one through storytelling and and reduce the stigma that's associated with a dementia diagnosis. Um, There's sleep is the best medication, tips for eating and drinking, understanding changes in mood and behavior and caring for the caregiver, which is very important. So you touch on so Mm -hmm. many in 12 chapters, so many of the very pertinent issues for caregivers. Well, and I think I think where sorry, go on. I think I think where it came from when I got the idea for well, I wasn't I didn't plan to write a book. I started writing a blog, and um, and a lot was based on my memory clinic work because um, I worked in two different memory clinics over the years because I, I gleaned from a lot of people who had dementia, but also their families. There were some similar themes that were cropping up all the time that you just, you seem to think, right, yeah, this seems to be coming up, you know. So I think from there, that's when I started writing a blog. And then I think a few friends sort of said, oh, why don't you put this into a book? So I'd not thought about that at all. It wasn't planned. But then at the end of every chapter, um, I created some notes pages so that people could write their own, whether you want to call it a care plan, or I don't always want to medicalize or, or make a nursing thing, but but you can tailor the information in the book to your needs. So, um, and there's some quick tips. And I'm very conscious that carers have, caregivers have very little time and are shattered. So I've made the book very, it's bite-sized chunks. It's a large font as well so that people can actually, you know, not have to concentrate too much. They can dip in and out of it, really. So, so that's the, the plan. This copy I have is a paperback, but is it available in Kindle and ebook, and, and is it an audio book? 
It's not audio book yet. I'm trying to get there. Uh, I want to get there, definitely. Um, yes, it's an ebook as well. Okay. And also building on the book, then there's a course for care, caregivers yes. as well, which is full of films and you're in there as well. Oh, yeah. And and I want to get, and there's quite a few outsourcers in there, which is great. So getting yes. everybody's voice, I steal everyone's voices, you see, um, <laughs> and, and put it all together in this course. So it's a sort of, it builds on the book and it's a living, breathing, um, you can dip in and out, mm-hmm. sign in, log in, you, you, it's like a one payment and it's, you have lifetime access and then you can, you can look at things as and when you need them really. And it is very much based on your experience. People who have dementia as well, their stories, what they're experiencing, how they feel. I've learned so much from them as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as, as well as professionals then working in different specialities. So. Yes, I was very honored to be invited to be a part of your um, course. I and think the honor was mine, Marianne. Oh, <laughs> that's so sweet. And we and I did have to sign like a, a consent or an agreement, so you didn't steal steal my steal my voice. <laughs> and um, I forget what we talked about. I think it was about storytelling, the value of storytelling and caregiving, dementia care, mm. which is like my my topic. So hopefully people will understand that because when you share your story with others, even if, you know, you think maybe this person doesn't know what, what I'm going through, a lot of people are pleasantly surprised to find out that they've broken that stigma and now that other person is free to express their story. And mm. um, when you start hearing, you know, like in my office, there's six of us and we have, you know, three of us touched by dementia of six Mm -hmm. people in that office. Mm -hmm. I went to a writer's conference and this was years ago when my book was fresh, probably around 2014 or 15. And I sat at a table with four, three other women, two of them I did not even know. And then we said, well, what is your book about? And then when I mentioned the book, everybody at that table had somebody in their family with dementia. And if I hadn't Mm -hmm. mentioned the book, we wouldn't have uncovered that little tidbit of information that we shared because people don't want to talk about it. So once you yeah. break through that barrier, now you can have meaningful conversations and share your experiences and maybe learn from each other. What, what to do when this happens? How do I handle that? You know, where do I go from mm. this? That's what people need to know. And I just find a lot of people think that they're out there on their own and they're not. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what I wanted to get from outsourcers mm-hmm. onto my platform so mm-hmm. that we can all share that. So that mm-hmm. there's a whole thing on personal stories. And like you say, the value of all of your books, the the storytelling. Um, and even though everybody's experience is different, there are similarities. But that knowing you're not alone. I've heard so many people say that, that yeah. what a difference, what a difference. And, and the work that outsourcers is doing is phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it really is in, you know, because there is a catharsis in writing those stories too, isn't there? I can understand. Yeah. People tell me a lot, you know, it's like many people, some people write their stories in real time as it's being lived. Some people don't write their story for 10 years or even more after Mm. it's been over and they still have all of this and living inside of them and they don't know what to do with it or where to put it. So when they finally Mm. decide to release it and and put it in a written word, mainly with the objective of being able to help others because they have Mm. learned such painful lessons in over such a long period of time and Mm. to just keep that to themselves. It just doesn't seem right. They want to at least impart some of their wisdom so somebody else wouldn't have to suffer and, you know, wait months or years to figure it out when somebody can just yeah. say, look, this is what's going on and here's what you do about it. And they say mm. that when they write that, it is very catharsis and it's like reliving the entire experience all over again. And it's a way mm. for them to try to deal with and make sense of what happened because in the moment, you know, you're going you're putting out little fires all day long and you don't have time to reflect on what's mm-hmm. happening. I mean, it's just go, 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 go. And we don't have that time where we can sit back and think about it and maybe try to put some order in, into it. Yeah. And that doesn't exist. So then later on, you're able to kind of like, it's like your brain when you're sleeping, processing like everything that happened during that day. So mm-hmm. you're finally able to put that 
to rest. And many people say that they go through it. It's cathartic. It's, you know, makes the, they cry. It's very emotional. But at the end, when they finally finish, it makes them feel that there's, they're at peace. Yeah. I think, I think from what I'm realizing with all of you, I feel, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm hearing. And also I think caregivers are really hard on themselves. Mm -hmm. So when they're able to read some of your books, it's realizing, no, this is hard. This, this is, is hard. You, you, we didn't sign up for this. Do you know, so, you know, when people talk about their, if they, if they're married and their, their vows and it's like, yeah, but that wasn't an informed vow. You wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't, have any idea and and actually without some of our help in some ways how would you have an idea of what to do and, and i think that's no. what my passion is about is explaining what some why some people who have dementia react in certain ways so if we can understand that you know say they're not seeing very well they're not hearing very well so all their senses might be um very distorted we you know and, and maybe then by understanding what that person's going through, we can understand a lot of the time people who have dementia are living in f absolute fear mm -hmm. because they may not be understanding what we're saying to them. They may not be able to, to express themselves. And of course, when you're the caregiver, you don't know that's what's going on, do you? Because you're, you're living your world and trying to, like you say, put out the fires. So yeah, and that, the, the practical and emotional, um, support that we can all give through our through outsourcers and through my work and if and everyone else who's on your podcast um is it's lovely to be part of this it really is lovely to 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 be with a lot of other passionate people who feel the same mm -hmm. and i think that that's why i've sort of brought in a lot of people onto my training courses i've brought in people of different types of dementia caregivers such as yourself, Jean, and I'm hoping many more, um, and Christy. And um, and people, you know, we've got doctors that specialise in certain areas, speech therapists. So, and I was saying to you earlier, wasn't I, I've learned so much from everyone else as well. We never stop learning of different approaches that might help. And I, I think in some ways my role is is about sometimes it's converting a lot of complex information, perhaps from some researchers who can do amazing research, but write in a very high fluting way. I can sort of <clears throat> translate their work into practical, meaningful um, information for everyday people that need that needs some just very basic um, communication about what's going on and what we can do to help. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us um, more about the course itself. How is that structured? What can people expect if they, you know, log into your website and, and obtain the course? Okay. So I've, I've got, this is the course for families. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, I, I do also have short courses for members of the public, anyone else. And I've got, done training for nurses and other, other professionals. But it, again, I've looked at the same sort of themes from my book because these seem to be the big thing. Everyone always thinks about memory first and it's to me, it's not, it's communication, isn't it? You know, so, you know, so, so the first, the basically they can go on and they'll be, I don't like to call them modules because that makes it sound a bit too academic, but they are sort of blocks of themes. So you can click on, there's one on understanding dementia. So that's where you know, we talk about different types of dementia, how it may affect the person in different ways. So I'll give a talk on that. And then I'll have somebody who's got young onset Alzheimer's disease on there talking about how it affects them. And then I've also got caregivers talking about their experience. Um, and then also some other professionals. So we've got everybody's voices in there. Then the second theme that you can click on is about communicating. I, I also talk quite a bit or we've created animations as well. So the resources are enjoyable. They're not heavy going to watch, you know, so there'll be animations and um, films, audios and some presentations. So it's, you know, nothing's very long. You can click in and out as and when you want. So the one on communication is, you know, I've got 10 top tips for how to communicate. But we also 
rewinding back on everything. It's we talk about first of all how and why we communicate in the first place, and then how that can go wrong in dementia, and then what we can do to help. So that that's sort of the communication side. Then there's uh, one on environment surroundings. So how a person may be seeing. So we've got some films about how how they may be seeing the world around them. It could be that they're everything might be distorted. They may not be able to actually work out where their body is in space and time. And we, I didn't know that when I worked in a nursing home years ago. I didn't mm. know that. I used to mm. hand someone a cup of tea. I used to be aware that maybe, you know, but actually that they may not even know where a part of their body is in relation to the rest of them. So, again, talk about that. Talk about the environment. Often people who have dementia are really struggling to process information and attention. And this is a lot of the research work I'm doing in the university. Uh, attention, hearing, all of these things, you know, it might all be just too much to take on. So, I mean, one of my biggest bugbears is when I've gone into care homes is when the radio is on really loudly. Um, and you're just thinking, are people enjoying this? We don't know. Uh, sometimes people will withdraw because they're not able to actually express themselves. So just because they're sitting in the chair quietly, they might be going through a bit of a living hell with that noise in the background and we don't know. So again, it's educating about that. Um, they've got to compete for other noises to try and understand what's going on. So we talk a lot about communication and how everything slows down and all around the attention circuits in the brain. I've also um, got a theme which is around understanding the people's moods and um, their emotions and how um, we've got an animation created which talks about emotions and how they affect, how they affect our moods generally when, before anything has gone wrong. So if we can understand that, then how that affects our moods and then how that affects how we behave – and then what can happen when someone has dementia? Because they're not able to communicate very well, they will communicate through their emotions and their behaviours. Right. So again, it's ex explaining that because perhaps you can't get your words out, you can't mm -hmm. express your, your needs. Maybe you're in a, uh, a room where there's cast shadows, you might be misperceiving things. So it, talks, it goes into massive depth, really, in nice chunks. Um and again, then how we can help reduce somebody's agitation by actually looking at the surroundings that they're in. Too much clutter, too many patterns, there's too much for them to uh, attend to. Mm -hmm. So that can be very stressful. Um, again, then, uh, what's the name? Then there's the personal stories, that theme as well. So, and then within all of these, there's the, like you, you've talked a lot about the legal and the practical sides and what you need to do. So this, this, as well as the emotional, it's very much the, this is what you need to do. And we have to sometimes be quite pragmatic in how we say these things, isn't it? Yes. And I often um, said that, you know, once you get your diagnosis, the next step is to go to your attorney and, and get that paperwork in place. That's not something you yeah. can wait on. Yeah. You know, you need to have your um, your living will and your power of attorney or um, your HIPAA here in the United States, your pri the Privacy Act. You need to have all of those papers in order, even your like your last yeah. testament, if you have, you know, yeah. assets that you want to distribute in, in a particular way. Once um, you pass over that threshold into the dementia, then you're not able to put those papers together anymore. No. You know, that may not um, and, be. And that, the important yeah. thing is that we talk, we don't like to talk about these things, like we don't no. like to talk about death, but actually these are important things we do talk mm -hmm. about. And I know I, I have um, a person on on the training who has posterior cortical atrophy, and he says this. I, I The one best thing he did, though, was that he made sure everything was in order, and he knows that he can trust the person who is will be his attorney when the time comes. I mean, there are honest conversations about this yep. um, and, and all around advanced care planning, knowing what, um, you know, what's the potential 
you know, nobody knows what the future holds for anyone, but actually knowing what, being able to put down your wishes in terms of your care and your treatment as well, that's a huge, yeah. that's a huge area. Yeah. I've been doing that a lot with my own family and it's, thank God we had my, my stepfather's paperwork done um, when we did, because a year later he was diagnosed. And so then I had, I had, didn't have to contend with that at the time because it was already very distressing in and of itself. But Mm. of knowing that I had the power to, you know, sign papers for him and manage his monies and, and create a trust and, put him in a nursing home which was was his he went from home to nursing home there was nothing in between not even home care nothing in between he never Mm -hmm. went in yeah he was so far gone by the time we got diagnosed so that really was a blessing for me as the caregiver because it was like that's like a giant mountain that i didn't have to climb so i always recommend people to pay much attention to that it's not something to put off no, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's always a frightening thing. I've recently gone through it with my mum, actually, um, who experienced delirium recently. Mm-hmm. And it is shocking when it happens because it yeah. that can be very sudden. So I talk about delirium because that's, um, that's something, that's a condition that can happen quite rapidly, particularly and people who have dementia are at risk. Um, and, yeah, making sure those decisions are put into place yeah you know and uh, mm. yeah how do people obtain the course uh i've got a website called it's called finding the light intervention.com it's the same title as the book and there is a when you go on to the home page there is a uh there are links to the book the course for families uh, the training, if there were more, you know, people working in the professional field who were interested in the training, so they could just go onto the home page and click through on there. Then, okay, mm-hmm. that sounds wonderful. And the book is available on the Oz Authors Bookstore as well. Yep, yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. So, is there anything else you'd like to tell the listeners before we say goodbye? Um, just to say, you're not alone to say, listen to these Alts Authors podcasts. These these authors are phenomenal in bring, and really passionate in bringing together uh, because, because more often than not, we've been there. Um, so, and spread the word, spread the word to anyone you know that there are things that can be done. Don't hide, don't bury your head in the sand if, there's, if there is a diagnosis or you're concerned about anything because it's far better to actually face what's there because you can do something about it. Yes, absolutely. Yes, the best. Yes. Mm. Thank you so much, mm. Jane. It's lovely to have you on well, the show. Is, can people find you on social media? Yes, I've got, um, I'm on, my Twitter handle is Duet Care. So that's the name of my company. It's D-U-E-T Care. So that actually stands for Dignity, Understanding, Empathy Training. Oh, um, yeah, that's what I started off before. I, I That's what my training was going to be called until I realized I needed to make it more clear. But the whole thing of duet care is about the duet between the person giving the care and the person receiving that partnership. So that's where that sort of that's when I first started out, really, on that side. And I'm on Facebook, uh, I think. I can send you the links to those, Marianne, but it's all under the findingthelightanddementia.com okay. banner. So we will, we will put all of that in the show notes. So Thank you. I encourage all the listeners to check out the show notes at the end of the show and uh, uh, find the links and explore your website and, and take a look at your book and, and maybe get that, get a copy of that for yourself to guide your own mm-hmm. dementia journey. It's important to have a number of resources. So... You know, Absolutely. this is a great one. Caregiver guides categorized as caregiver guide. We have memoir. We have mm. children's books, poetry books, a lot of stuff in our collection. So over 400 resources. So we encourage you to take That's a massive look. visit. It. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It started out with just three. <laughs> Brilliant. It just shows how it's needed, though, doesn't it? Yeah. In mm. 2015, there were just three of us. And now... You know, there's over 400 and they just keep coming. It's kind of like 
people tell us that they wrote their books, just some people, just so they could have it in our collection, which is kind of crazy. Wow. But yeah. Well, I th- that's rather lovely, though, actually, because you've yeah. given people an idea that they might not have thought of before. And yeah. they're part of something bigger. Again, you're not alone. Right. Huge and we try thing. to make it easy for the busy caregiver to find what they need, you know, in just a matter of minutes rather than going to like Google or Amazon and sifting through thousands yeah. and thousands of things that don't really pertain to, to their need. Yeah. Or they may not be credible either. There is an awful lot. I, I recently did do a dementia awareness course, just to have a little look. And I was a bit horrified, actually, quite a lot of stuff, just from a generic training company. There's a yeah. lot of stuff in there that was really not appropriate and really not accurate. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's about that credibility yeah. of where we all come from, isn't it? Yeah. All of our so. books are vetted by uh, caregivers and authors. So mm-hmm. I know mine was. <laughs> Yours was. Yeah, we all know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, look, we read them. They get read cover to cover. So we um, don't accept every book that comes our way. So we're not like a book posting site. You have to earn your place. You do. You do. Yeah. High, well, high standards. Very high standards. Because <laughs> uh, our mm-hmm. caregivers, they, they need that. They we don't want to waste their time on on books that aren't going to be relevant or accurate. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Jane. Aww. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Lovely to see you too. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alls Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it on whichever platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on All's Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony. Hi, I'm Anne of All's Authors. When I was caring for my mother with dementia, I searched long and hard for memoirs and personal stories about other caregivers' experiences. I wanted to know not just how other people survived, but how they thrived. Unfortunately, at the time, there was not much available. That's why we created the bookstore at allsauthors.com. Now, busy caregivers can easily browse for just the right resource to guide them on their journey. Books are categorized by relationship and type of dementia, as well as genre. You'll find a helpful title in just minutes using our search tool. So, after the podcast, take a few moments to visit our bookstore at allsauthors.com bookstore. Remember, you are not alone.